I mean, if you've been a part of this series of messages, which today we're ending, this is the fourth message in the series. So if, you, if you've been a part of this series, then, then, then you know how bogus that video is in view of what's communicated there. In fact, you don't even need to be a part of this series if you have lived life as a believer in Christ. You know from personal firsthand experience that life will be filled with trials and hardships. They will come. And if you've put your nose in this book, any at all, and read what is contained in this book as well, you know it. So on multiple levels, you know how bogus that, that video is. One of the verses that I've used now multiple Sundays, I don't know if I've used it every Sunday, but I know I've used it at least in two of them, is something Jesus said that's recorded in John chapter 16, verse 33. This was toward the very tail end of his earthly life before his crucifixion. He made this comment to his disciples. He said, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. He stated it very matter-of-factly. There is not any wishy-washiness about it, like vagueness, like, well, I think you might, you know, it's very possible. There's none of that. It's stated very matter-of-factly that, that while you're here on earth, you will have many, not just some, you will have many trials and sorrows. Now, we can deny that if we want to, but in so doing, we're living in some kind of an imaginary world. You know, if that, if that be the stance we decide to take. But here's the thing that's been floating around in my mind the last several days. As I've been thinking about closing up this series of messages and, and thinking about, you know, today's overall topic and everything that we've been, uh, that we were going to approach. I've had this phrase that kept going through my mind. And, uh, well, and here it is. And so I decided, well, let's just go ahead and make it the first main point in our message today. Experiencing adversity can be beneficial. Experiencing adversity can be beneficial. I want to encourage you just to let that kind of hover in your mind a little bit. Like I said in, in my study this week, I kept being reminded of that. It seemed that no matter which way I tried to turn and I tried to study it maybe in a different angle or something like that, all roads kind of led back to this, this particular point. And so I quit fighting it and decided this is going to be the central point of what it is we're going to talk about today. Now, perhaps there was another component that was playing into all of this I am going on about 10 days now of having uh, some kind of dental issues going on here in my mouth. And so you guys know what dental pain can be like, I, I would imagine. Um, I've never had a root canal before, but, uh, but that is kind of being thrown around. But, you know, as soon as, about 10 days ago, as soon as it came up, I was absolutely miserable that day. And so I, I got into the doctor as, as soon as I could and and they did all the x-rays and probing and all this kind of stuff. And they said, no, it looks all fine. You know, you don't have need of a root canal. And I'm like, well, it's not fine. There's something going on in there. And uh, so he ended up referring me to, to a specialist. And, uh, um, of course, the specialist is all booked up until now this Tuesday. So, uh, so I've been living on a steady diet of pain pills for a few days now, so so uh, take that um, for what it's worth in your in your note taking there. You know, preacher was on drugs during this sermon. Yeah. <laughs> so while I haven't had a full night's sleep in the last ten days, and I some would argue haven't had a clear head for those ten days as well. This is the thing that I've kept being reminded of over this time, and, and especially during this week when I was preparing this message, is that very thought. Experiencing adversity can be beneficial. 
And so I wonder how many others in this room are being benefited right now, here recently. Anybody been in any fender benders? Have you had that benefit enter into your life? Any of you, you know, had doctor's issues, appointments, and pains, and aches? Anyone had a water heater go out recently? Or lost a job? There you go. There's a good benefit. How about, how about that? How many of you have lost a job here recently? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you think of it from that perspective, and it almost sounds like it's kind of crazy talk. Experiencing adversity can be beneficial. That sounds kind of goofy. Some people may be thinking, well, Brad, I think those painkillers are killing off some brain cells along the way. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, that's very possible. But at the same time, I still stand by that statement. And I believe it is true. And I believe it's true both on the basis of what the Bible teaches and on the basis of what I have experienced in my life. You know, as I've spent some time this week reflecting on this. Remember this particular passage of Scripture? It's James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. And, and if I have referred to this passage in this series, I didn't go back in my notes and double-check this, but, it, but if I have, it was only a passing reference. I haven't used this in any kind of a major way in this whole series. Here's what it says. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully tested, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. That's coming from the New Living Translation. In some ways, it's, it's remarkable that we haven't really spent much time on this passage of Scripture in this series in view of what it is that we've been talking about because this passage does deserve some attention in view of our subject matter. What this passage is teaching us is that growth, character, and maturity develop in a person's life in the midst of times of testing. That's when stuff like that gets hammered out in a person's life. Character, maturity. I mean, you could interject the word Christ-likeness. I mean, that's when that kind of stuff gets developed is in the middle of adversity, in the middle of trials. However, just a word of advice I would give you that uh, in view of, of me saying this and the additional thoughts I'm getting ready to say, one thing I would give you by way of personal counsel is uh, don't take this and go to someone who you know is really struggling in a major way right now and, and, and go up to them and say, you know what, I just want you to be aware that based on what the Bible says, I really do envy you right now. I envy you because of all this character and development and stuff like that that's going to happen in your life. I actually had that happen to me. Back in 1987, I had a couple that came to me and it was in the middle of, of the worst of the whole ordeal as far as the battle with cancer that I had. It was in the middle of that time that I was bedridden, and, and, uh, and they did. They, they basically just shared how they had been praying, and, and, uh, um, and they had thought of this particular verse and everything, and they just, they just wanted me to know. This, this was the thing they really wanted to communicate and visit with me about is how much they really were envying me. At that time. Now, some of you don't think of me as being the most polite person in the world. But my mom did teach me to bite my tongue sometimes. Okay? And, and I wanted to say a couple of things right then and there when I was hearing that. Not the least of which is I'll gladly slide out of this bed so you can climb in this bed, you know, if it can work that way. You know, uh, I mean, I was just like, how in the world can you come in in the middle of everything that I was going through and to be able to, to say something along those lines? But the truth of the matter is, technically, they were correct. 
in what they were saying that something good was in the process of happening. You know, but that's just not the way to approach it. Some translations use, like the New Living Translation, uses the word troubles. Some translations use words like trials or tests. But basically, what this passage, uh, among the other passages that can convey uh, the same sort of thing, like Romans chapter 5 and some of those, is, is that is that when we go through times of trials and hardship, they have a way of stretching us and hammering out uh, something within our life. That something is faith. So that something is, is that we would be more complete, that we would be more mature, that we would be more Christ-like. And it's in the middle of all the adversity and, and, and the trials that that comes to pass. Now, we emphasize around here about the importance of getting your nose in this book. I mean, that's something that uh, we regularly challenge people to do is you need to spend time in the Bible. And we're encouraging people to re every year read through the Bible in a year. We're encouraging people to become a part of a small group that studies the Bible, you know, that, that you can spend some time getting to know better God's Word and applying it to your life. And, 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 and we, we emphasize the importance of meditating upon God's Word, and rightly so. There's good reason for that. Passages like 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You know, God's Word's inspired, it's, 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 it's God-breathed, and it's useful for helping us to become the people that God wants us to be. I mean, that's what that passage says. So for good reason, we should spend some time, serious time, in God's Word. But don't kid yourself, Christian growth isn't confined to a classroom. And if you're operating on that notion, thinking that simply by being a part of a small group, simply by coming on Sunday morning and hearing you know, some of Brad's short sermons, if you're operating on the assumption that doing stuff like that is going to help you to really grow as a Christian, then uh, you're really not seeing the big picture in this. Christian growth is not confined to a classroom. I've lost track of the number of times that I've told people that the period of time that I felt like I, in hindsight, grew more spiritually than in any other time or period of time in my life was not when I was sitting in a chair like the one that you're sitting in right now or was not when I was sitting in a classroom chair in Bible college, but rather it was when I was laying flat in bed. Whether that be my home my own bed at home, or whether that was a hospital bed, that that was where some of the, the biggest growth was actually taking place. During those two years, there were some things that were happening that possibly would have never happened in a classroom. The passage of Scripture in James chapter 1 says, consider it an opportunity for joy specifically uses that phrase. Now, just by way of clarification, I do want to say that, that that's not because it's fun. That's not why James was saying what he was saying there. Consider an opportunity for great joy because it, you're going to have a blast going through this. That is not a proper way to interpret this passage of Scripture because, because it, trials and hardships and stuff like that, they're not fun. As a matter of fact, they're hard. They can be very hard. Now, I, I'm not a person that generally gravitates toward watching musicals, okay? It's just, just not in my DNA, apparently, um, and I'm talking about movies and stuff like that that are, that are musicals. But uh, I, I did just watch a musical two nights ago. It was Friday, Friday evening. Um, uh, you heard the one that's out, Into the Woods. That, that you know, I, I saw where they take a bunch of fairy tales and they weave it all together. And it's a musical. And, 
And, uh, you know, and it, it wasn't because I'd been dying to see that, but uh, it was because Colette reminded me, this is Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> so I was like, okay, all right, let's watch it. Yeah. So we did. <clears throat> I've probably seen three or four musicals in my life, maybe more than that, but uh, at least I can think of three or four. Uh, most of them I've intentionally blocked out of my mind. But, um, but I can, hands down, I, I remember the one I liked the most. And this wasn't too long after we had gotten married. It probably was early 80s, you know. We went to Wichita to visit Colette's grandmother. And, and while we were there for the weekend, we were in Bible college during that time. We, we went to the movie, and we uh, watched Fiddler on the Roof. You ever, see, you ever seen that? You know, and, you know, the storyline on that, you know, I, I thought was a great storyline and had elements of, you know, um, how the Jewish people, you know, have battled adversity, you know, throughout, you know, history. And, and, uh, but yet also the, the immediate theme of that particular movie is, about a Jewish man, Tevya, uh, who's attempting to hold on to traditions in the middle of a changing world. And it's a real struggle to do that. And he's got a family filled with daughters. And, uh, um, and at one point in the movie, he's really groaning, you know, and he talks to God spontaneously, he just talks to God throughout the movie. And, and, uh, and one particular time, he's, he's kind of complaining a little bit because of, of all the hardship that the Jewish people have experienced down through the years. And I believe the classic line, you know, when I think of that movie, the line that stands out above everything else is the line that's stated at that time. So we got a little clip here I want you to see. Personally, I don't know why there has to be this trouble between people, but I thought I should tell you. Thank you, Your Honor. You are a good man, <laughs> if I may say so. It's too bad you are not a Jew. <laughs> That's what I like about you, Tevye. You're always joking. Congratulations again for your daughter. Thank you, Your Honor. Oh, about the other matter, it won't be too bad. I wouldn't worry. Yeah, of course not. Dear God, did you have to send me news like that today of all days? I know, I know we are the chosen people. But once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Yeah, there you go. Once in a while, can you just choose someone else? We, like Tevya, would like the option, if that option were available to us, to be able to skip the trials, to be able to skip the hardships that come our way in life. But... But the truth of the matter is, that's not an option that's available to any of us. It's a reality of life that we're going to encounter stuff like that at one time or another. So one of the things that we can learn, both from experience, but also from passages like James chapter 1, is that experiencing adversity can be beneficial. That's one of the things. That, that we clearly can walk away with. But today, there's another angle on this that I want you to consider. As I said, generally speaking, and I think I talked about this briefly in an earlier message, um, we tend to look at adversity from one perspective. We primarily look at adversity as being an evil, bad thing that has no rightful place in our life. 
That's the, that's the way, as soon as it invades our life, as soon as that doctor delivers the news, as soon as we get that phone call, as soon as we, you know, whatever way it's delivered to us, just as soon as we receive it, we see it as being evil, we see it as being bad, we see it as having no place rightfully in our life. And so sometimes we end up playing that role of a victim. We end up, you know, starting to say, why me? You know, man, I'm really trying here. I'm trying to live a life, God, that pleases you. We kind of go into that mode of woe is me in the middle of it all. And in fact, immediately as believers, what what we oftentimes do, and, and, and in a lot of ways, rightfully so, is we begin praying. We begin praying that God will remove this from us. God will deliver us out of this, whatever it is. Whether it's a health issue, a financial issue, a relationship problem, whatever, God, you deliver me from this. And we immediately begin praying along those lines, and we contact some of our friends, and we get other people praying the same way. Deliver me from this. I mean, because we see it as being an evil, bad thing that has no rightful place in our life. But here's what I want you to know. God intends for adversity to serve a purpose in the lives of Christians that that goes beyond us. And I really want you to take this to heart today. Let me show you a passage of Scripture that we're not quite as familiar with as the James chapter 1 passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this. And by the way, verse 4 is the memory verse for this week. It says, Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now I want you to see, I want you to see what, what this says in another translation. As a matter of fact, this is going to be one of those rare times that I'm going to show you something from the message, which technically isn't a translation, it's a paraphrase of the Bible, so it's a little looser, and so, so you know, I, 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 I make use of it, you know, when it's something that's spot on, um, but there's a lot of different passages in the message that they take some liberty with that make me uncomfortable. However, this particular verse, verse 4 of the passage that's on the screen, they hit it out of the park in the message. Here's the way it reads there. He, and that's in reference to God, he comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Wow, that's good. That's good. I mean, what it's saying there. I mean, how cool is that? What is being stated? That, that God, the way that God has ministered to us, the way that God has benefited and helped us and comforted and strengthened us in the middle of whatever the adversity was, we will get an opportunity to do that sort of thing in the life of someone else. Now as a result of our experience and what we've just now gone through. I mean, that's basically what this passage is saying. God helps us so that we can help others. Friends, I want you to understand this. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. For for some reason, you know, that's almost like an unspoken understanding that we function with. Sometimes, and, and, and I, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't think it has a biblical basis to it. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. He comforts us so we can comfort others. That's why he comforts us. That's why he reaches into our life and he brings that blessing, that healing. So that we will be able to turn around and we'll be able to do that with others. 
When you go through hurt, God enables you to identify with someone else who one day will have a similar hurt to whatever it is that you are going through at this present time. In a sense, it's the whole theory that's behind support groups. I mean, if you think about it, it really is. Support groups isn't something that someone invented in the 20th or 19th century or something like that. It was kind of God's idea from the beginning. That's what he's talking about in this passage of Scripture. I mean, let's break it down and let's look at it closely. No one understands the struggles of alcohol addiction like who? An alcoholic. That's part of the point that's being made here. No one understands the agony of divorce as much as someone who has been divorced, been through that. No one fully knows the pain and the dark place that depression can take you as much as someone who has been depressed. I'm not saying that, that, well, I've never been depressed or I've never been divorced, so I can't help people like that. I'm hands off. I'm not saying that that's to be the attitude that any of us have. I'm just saying that people that have been depressed, people that have been divorced, they are people that are capable of ministering on a level that goes beyond what some of the others of us can do. No one grasps the struggle that is associated with battling cancer as much as someone who sat in that doctor's office and had the doctor break that news to them that they've got cancer. No one knows the level of pain that a parent goes through, a mother goes through, a father goes through when they lose a little child. No one knows that pain as much as someone who's lost a little child. No one knows how, how quickly all your hopes and, and, and just excitement and anticipation, how, how quickly that can be shattered in a miscarriage as much as someone who's had a miscarriage. No one knows the level of which it can really be a battle. It can be a struggle to walk in one day out of the blue and to be given your walking papers at work and told, yeah, we're downsizing or whatever spin they put on it. You don't have a job anymore. Collect your stuff and go home. And that panic of how do I make ends meet? How do I pay the bills? Because those are going to keep coming. Nobody knows what all goes through a person's mind as much who's going through that as much as the person who's been through that. That's what I'm saying. God allows us to suffer so we are able to comfort others who go through similar experiences. if, If you grasp that, you accept that, you internalize that, I mean, all of a sudden, you're going to start looking at adversity in a very different way than you did before as a believer. All of a sudden, now you're going to, I mean, the questions of why, 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 you, all of a sudden, now you're going to see there actually is some purpose behind what is happening and how God wants to use this. Hardships equip us to comfort others. I guess you could say God is in the business of developing comforters. And that's what he's doing. And right now in this room, there are some of you that God's working overtime with in helping you to become a comforter. Helping you to be in a place where you will be able to reach into someone's life and you'll be able to minister to them on a level that you would have never been able to before. I mean, that goes a long way in understanding why God doesn't just deliver us from 
adversity. Instead, he delivers us through it. That goes a long way in understanding that better. Because there's something else that God is trying to accomplish in our lives. Our ushers are going to be getting up at this time and preparing for our time of communion. And while they are, what I want to encourage you to do today is is I want you just to spend a little time and reflect. In what way is God working in your life right now? What kind of preparations is God in the middle of making in your life? I'm not saying that God has caused whatever the adversity is that you might be battling with, but, uh, but God can use it. God can use it in a big way. So what is it that he's using? What is it that he's trying to accomplish within you? I mean, that goes beyond just, well, the development of character and endurance, and not to belittle any of that, but, you know, Christ-likeness. And, I mean, that, that it all is part of the benefit that can come in the aftermath of going through adversity. But what is it, today we're asking the question, what is it that God is trying to do to make it possible for you to reach into someone's life like God reached into your life and brought healing into your life. What is it God is doing in your life right now to better equip you to be able to reach into someone else's life and to be able to bring healing to them? What is it that God is doing right now to better equip you to be able to help someone else as God has helped you that you can help them? As God is, as, has strengthened you and comforted you, what is it God is doing to help you to be able to strengthen and comfort someone else? You see, God doesn't just comfort you so you'll be comfortable. That's not the way it works. God's got a bigger picture in mind. And he wants you to be able to be a blessing to someone else. And so we need to be aware of what he's doing, how he's doing it. And then we need to live our lives not with tunnel vision, but rather instead with our eyes open, alert and aware of people around us that we work with, within our extended family, our acquaintances, or even new friends that we come across that we need to be sensitive and aware of the needs that they have because we might just discover God paired us up with this person for a very good reason. He's got something for us to do, to be a blessing, to be a comfort, to be a healer in this person's life. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today for this time we've been able to spend talking about a subject that obviously does have relevance the the only reason it wouldn't have relevance is if we just prematurely have decided I don't want to accept what is being spoken because your word's pretty clear this is what you're about this is what you want to accomplish through your people So, Father, I pray that in this room you will find a a whole lot of people that are receptive and who want to be used by you. You reached into our life and you felt our pain in a major way when you sent Jesus to die on our behalf. We were in a desperate way, but you did the unthinkable. And you not only shared in our pain, you took our pain. Father, might we always reflect on that and allow that to be a big part of the inspiration that launches us forward in reaching into the lives of others and being able to help them in ways that we have been helped and being able to comfort and strengthen them. Sometimes just by holding their hand, sometimes by crying with them, sometimes by being able to share 
insight into part of what got us through the thick of it all. Father, we want to be people in your service. And we want to be that way because it's the least we can do in view of all that you have done and continue to do in our lives.